afternoon at 7.30. Uh, sorry about the photo that I just took. Look, I had the deer in the headlight look, but that's okay. So on Thursday, we have a Bio 201 final covering enzymes and some energy and cellular respiration and photosynthesis. But as always, ask a scientist. You can ask any question you'd like, and I'll, I'll do my best to answer it. Um, and we'll see. Okay, so let's see if anybody has any questions coming in. Not yet, but I can tell you, you know, one of the things that I covered a lot that was not in the book is climate change. And, and the reason why I covered so much uh, or spent so much time on climate change is because it's one of the biggest challenges our society will face. And it's going to affect all life on this planet, including ourselves. And what's interesting is that climate change is really uh, tied a lot to both geological and biological processes. And as we look back through uh, the ages, we've seen that the climate has changed a lot in the past. And um, we look to see what has happened when the climate has changed and it's not been good, at least, at least temporarily. Um, when we, whenever we've had a lot of drastic climate change in the past has led to mass extinctions. We have also looked at climate change in the past to understand, well, what caused our climate to change? And uh, we've discovered a few things. Changes in the Earth's orbit, like Milankovitch cycles, changes in um, the position of the continents has, has affected us. Over long periods of time, the sun's output has also changed. And of course, periods of intense volcanism. And all of these natural causes also do one other thing. They change the composition of gases to our atmosphere, including uh, CO2 levels. And we've known since the 1890s, actually even a little bit earlier than the 1890s, that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. And that when we burn fossil fuels like coal and oil, that releases carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. And today we are releasing copious amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere. And we have some of the highest levels of carbon dioxide this world has seen in millions of years. And in fact, I just pulled up the data. If you go to the esrlnoaa.gov website, you can actually pull up the, uh, the latest data on CO2 in the atmosphere. And basically, uh, it's at 414 parts per million today. Well, that was yesterday, May 6th. And like I said, we haven't seen those levels in almost 100 million years. So that's a long time. So you're going to have some stuff on that final about climate change for certain, like, you know, what are the causes of climate change? How do we know humans have done it? And uh, those would be a couple of the things you want to you want to remember to study up on is and it's not in the book. Other things we're going to cover are cellular respiration and photosynthesis. You know, it's really important that with uh, photosynthesis and cellular respiration, they have some things in common and they have some things in, uh, that are different especially when it comes to photophosphorylation versus oxidative phosphorylation. I would definitely know how to compare and contrast those two processes. That's incredibly important. Okay, so i got more people coming in, but I don't have any questions on the top chat there. So if you've got your questions, now's a good time to, to ask them. And I'll keep going there. Okay, so like I was saying, uh, be sure that you can compare and contrast photo um, Phosphorylation with oxidative phosphorylation. Know where the electrons are coming from. Know the fate of those electrons. Know, uh, yeah, where they come from, the fate of them, where the energy for these for the phosphorylation comes from, and also know what these processes have in common. Like, what is the electron transport chain doing, and what are these electron carriers doing? Okay, I'm gonna pause for one second so I can uh, take my pups and put them out of the room. They are all excited because I'm here. Okay, Dax. Okay, Titus. Let's go outside, guys. Come on. Let's go. Outside. Come on, boys. Come on. Outside, boys. Come on. I know. I know. <laughs> okay. Those were my dogs, Titus and Dax. And uh, they're they're still very much puppyish, so they like lots of attention. Okay. So we got a question here. What is the difference between catabolic and anabolic reactions? Okay. You know, life is basically the sum of, all, of, a, of a lot of chemical reactions. And these chemical reactions include both breaking things down. That would be catabolic. So when you eat a protein, right, you just can't take the protein in milk or, or a steak or a hamburger or chicken or fish and incorporate that directly into your body. What we have to do is break that down, those proteins down into 
the constituent amino acids, the building blocks. That would be a catabolic reaction. Or we take a carbohydrate like glucose and we break that down into carbon dioxide and water. That would be a catabolic reaction. On the flip side, anabolic reactions. These reactions are building. So if I take amino acids and I build them into a protein, that would be an anabolic reaction. And uh, catabolic reactions are typically exergonic, not always, but they typically are. They release energy. So as we break down the foods we eat, the lipids and the proteins and the carbohydrates, that supplies both building blocks and energy for the anabolic reactions, which is where we're going to take these building blocks and create something more complex. And because the products are more complex than the reactants and anabolic reactions, these are also endergonic reactions because we're reducing entropy. Oh, got a lot of stuff coming in here now. So explain how substrate level phosphorylation works. Include endergonic and ender exergonic reactions and energy coupling in your answer. Oh, somebody's just quoting my, my question here, but that's okay. Substrate level phosphorylation. Well, I went out this year or this week and I bought new pens. And these are uh, dry erase, low emission. So hopefully they won't... Uh, be too toxic here. Some of these dry erase pens are, uh, yeah. Yeah, don't start sniffing them. Hopefully these won't get me here if these are brand new. So when we talk about substrate level phosphorylation, what we're gonna do is, let me see if I can get this going here and make sure I don't have a bad glare. Okay, so phosphorylation is whenever we're going to take something and phosphorylate it. So I've got ADP plus uh, phosphate. I, it, I draw the circle around the phosphate to make sure that that's not a phosphorus atom, but an actual phosphate. And so a phosphorylation event is anytime I stick a phosphate onto something. And in case of the substrate level phosphorylation, what I'm going to do is take adenosine diphosphate, which is the, the, the diform. We've got two phosphate groups here. And I'm going to add this phosphate to make ATP. So this is an endergonic reaction. Let me see if I can move this here like that. There we go. Okay, this is an endergonic reaction. This requires 7.3 kilocalories a mole. Uh, there's my pen, it's warming up. So to make this reaction happen, you must have this amount of energy, right? So this is an endergonic reaction requiring an input of energy. So whenever we have substrate level phosphorylation, imagine I've got a protein and I've got a protein and I'm not much of an artist here. But we have what is called an active site, right? And what I'll do is I'll take something like ADP, okay? So now I've got an enzyme. This is my enzyme right here. This is my substrate. So this is um, substrate level. And what this active site, there's actually another active site right here. I'm going to take my phosphate. And what's going to do, what this enzyme is going to do is facilitate this chemical reaction of adding that phosphate group to ADP to make ATP. And typically this phosphate is actually on some other molecule and we would call that a phosphorylated intermediate. So it's got more potential energy. And um, basically that's why we couple that because we have to get this energy from an exergonic reaction. So typically the um, whenever you add a phosphate group to another organic molecule, you increase the potential energy of that molecule. So then when you pop that phosphate group off of it, that's actually an exergonic reaction that produces more energy or releases more energy than this, so that this enzyme can then use that energy to phosphorylate ADP to uh, ATP, okay? And the reason why we call it a substrate level phosphorylation is because that's my active site, and of course, is ADP and my activated intermediate, my phosphorylated organic molecule, would be a substrate. Okay. Next one. At a molecular level, how does your body use reaction coupling to ensure that you can perform these tasks? Okay, so at the molecular level, like I said, these are dealing with a molecule. So the, the, the protein enzyme here, that would be a molecule. Make sure I can read this right. So inside yourselves for like, whenever you're having glycolysis going on, it's going to use these enzymes to phosphorylate ADP to ATP. And let me make sure I got that right. 
other how does your body use reaction come and ensure that it can perform these tasks yeah so i hope that that answers it now of course substrate level phosphorylation is a bit inefficient because you got to match your exergonic reaction to this endergonic reaction pretty closely because if you don't produce this much energy you get no atp and if you produce like twice as much you don't get twice as much atp you just get that same amount of atp and you lose the rest of your energy that's why you know chemiosmosis is so important for the secret to life because it's a very efficient way of making lots of ATP. Okay. What other work does ATP perform in cells aside from driving endergonic reactions? That's a, uh, a good question there. So if you think about it, um, our cells have to maintain homeostasis, right? So what that means is we're going to create an internal environment that's different from the outside world. And one of the ways we do that is by controlling the amount of electrolytes inside of our cells, right? So you want to maintain water balance. You, you can't really regulate water so well directly. There's no really pumping mechanism of water. But what you can do is you can move sodium and potassium ions and other ions in and out of the cell. So uh, sodium potassium pumps, you know, pumping uh, sodium out of your cell, potassium inside of your cell to maintain uh, proper electrolyte balance. That is almost 20% of our energy budget as an animal is maintaining the sodium potassium pumps. Uh, nerve conductance, uh, when you send a signal down your, your muscle so they contract, what's happening is that nerve conductance is allowing sodium ions to flood into your nerve cell and then they're pumped right back out. So once again, we see pumping action. Your muscles contract. Okay, I want my muscle to relax. I now have to pump the calcium ions back into the smooth, endoplasmic reticulum specifically is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum so if you're going to get that to relax you have to pump those calcium ions back in so those are some ways the atp is used inside of our cells besides just uh endergonic reaction so movement nerve conductance and maintaining homeostasis these are all important uh, things that atp are used for good question What is action potential in photosynthesis? Hmm. Okay, I'll have to admit, I'm a little stumped on what you mean by an action potential in photosynthesis. Typically, when I think of action potential, what I'm thinking of is uh, uh, sending a signal down a nerve cell in animals. So, Miranda, if you want to come back and, and maybe clarify that, I'll, I'll come back to you on that one. I'm not, not entirely sure what that is. And that could be my own lack of knowledge here. Okay. Grace Williams, why are organic molecules such as carbohydrates stable at room temperature? You know, that's a really good question. And I'll, I'll break out the, the board here with this. Oh, I'll use my child's bib here. Okay. So let's say uh, we got an organic molecule. And one we've been talking about a lot in class is, is glucose. So glucose, of course, is C6H12O6. Let's draw a glucose molecule as it would appear in water. And then here it is in water. Let me add in these hydroxyl groups. And when we look at, let's see how that's looking on the board right there. Okay, so this is, this is glucose, C6H12O6. Okay, now this chemical is stable. I mean, this is a, you know, sugar in your soft drink. This is also the, the building block of the paper we write on. Uh, it's also the building block of uh, our clothes if you're wearing cotton. And the question is, why does organic molecules like this and any other organic molecule like, you know, uh, gasoline, which is just basically octane or, or other forms of carbohydrates, why are they stable? And the reason is this. These lines represent a covalent bond and a covalent bond is sharing of these electrons between the elements oxygen and carbon or carbon and carbon and to break a bond even a weak bond like a hydrogen bond or a stronger bond like a covalent bond takes an input of energy so the reason why they're stable is because um, even though this molecule has lots of potential energy it takes energy to break these bonds. Now, every now and then an oxygen molecule will come along and oxidize this randomly, but it's, it's really slow. That's why your paper over decades turns yellow and slowly being oxidized, but not at the rate it was. If I added energy like a flame, 
whenever you add a flame to like paper, you provide enough energy to break that bond right there. And we know this as the activation energy. So if we were to draw our change in energy here, this is delta G over time. So this is delta G over time. The, the energy released is the difference between these are the reactants and these are the products. This change from here to here, this is my release of energy. This is my delta G, which would be negative, and this represents the activation energy. That's the energy required to break the bonds right there. So that's why they're stable. It, looks, it takes energy to break the bonds. Okay. Let's go. Well, questions are coming in fast. Okay. Difference between membranes and bacteria and archaea. That's a really good question. You know, we life has like a common ancestor, right? Like all life has LUCA, the last universal common ancestor. And we know this because we use the same 20 amino acids. We have the same four nucleotide bases. They're all the same 20 left-handed amino acids. Even the genetic code of life is based on the same 61 codons and three stop codons. And, uh, you know, so there's all these similarities. We all share glycolysis, chemiosmosis. But when it comes to the membranes between these two domains of archaea and bacteria, they are different. Let me shut my window. Okay. Now, the difference is, the, and the reason why we think these are so important is because they, these the, the molecules, even though they're phospholipids, are really different between bacteria and archaea, which makes me, which makes us think that they actually acquired these membranes independently of each other. I will draw the one for bacteria first, and also eukaryotes as well. So there's my phosphate group here, and then let's see, I got a fatty acid chain here, and I got my second fatty acid chain here. So if you notice, on this side, I've got the, the phosphate group, and then over here, I've got these fatty acid chains. So let me put that right there. Here's my fatty acid chains. And if you notice, at the end of a, of a fatty acid chain is a carboxyl group, and this forms what's called an ester bond, where it's carbon, oxygen, carbon with this double bonded oxygen right here. Now, when we get to archaeans, they're built radically differently, actually, even though they are both phospholipids. Just the phospholipids are really different. First of all, we don't really have fatty acid. Oh, got to draw that there. I'm so used to drawing the other one. O and then C. And one of the other differences, not only is the phosphate group on the opposite side here, so it's like left-handed versus right-handed, instead of using fatty acids, we use these things called isoprenoids, and isoprenoids are actually fairly strong, which is one of the reasons why uh, these archaea can live in such extreme environments, because they have these isoprenoid tails. So we have an ether bond here, and then instead of a fatty acid, if you notice, there are little methyl groups coming off of here, and I'm not exactly sure how to draw the, all the isoprenoids, but basically they have these extra methyl groups, which makes this even stronger. And this ether bond is a stronger bond than this ester bond, and of course, that's built backwards. So those are the differences between the archaean, this would be an archaean, and this would be a bacteria or a eukaryotic cell membrane. And because they're so different, the enzymes to make those and the pathways would be very different, so that's why we think they have separate origins. Okay. Where are we here? What is the second function of coenzyme A? Well, that's a good question. And for right now, whenever when I'm writing the test, I can tell you basically the only thing you need to know right now is that coenzyme A is used to bring acetaldehyde or an acetyl group into the Krebs cycle. But coenzyme A is also used uh, outside of the mitochondria and it's used as a, as a way to bring in um, 
uh, as you break down fatty acids to bring in acetaldehydes also to uh, um, the Krebs cycle. And I believe it's also involved with other metabolic functions, other anabolic functions inside the, uh, the cell as well. But I don't have any test questions on that. So we'll, we'll go on to the next one. Okay, destiny. Using the laws of thermodynamics, explain why all the chemical energy in a molecule of glucose cannot be converted solely to ATP. You know, that's a, a good question. And there are actually four laws of thermodynamics. For biology, we're going to focus on the first two, actually, the, the middle two. There's a zeroth law of thermodynamics. But the first one is energy can't be created or destroyed, which means that the energy in your reactants must be equal to the energy in your products plus any energy given off. Now, the reason why I can't take all, I think it's 686 kilocalories of mole of energy in a, in a molecule of glucose and make about 686 kilocalories of moles of ATP is because of that pesky second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics says, you know, every time I transfer or transform energy, I'm going to increase entropy. Some of that usable energy, which we call Gibbs free energy, is a loss to entropy. So what happens is, as you start breaking down glucose molecules and transferring and transforming some of that energy to ATP, or you're gonna actually transfer it, some of that energy is gonna be transformed into heat. And in fact, the body heat you're generating right now is a product of being released from the breakdown of the um, glucose molecules and fat molecules and everything else we have in our body that we're, we're breaking down. And um, this, that second law just says we, we can't be 100% efficient because you're going to always increase entropy. And in this case, like I said, a lot of that entropy that we're increasing and seeing is the production of heat. So that's why on the board, if you ever notice, I always wrote plus energy, heat, and ATP. And cellular respiration is about 40% efficient, which is one of the most efficient things we see in nature for energy transformations. Okay. Maxwell. What are some of the things we should know how to draw for the test? Oh boy, I would definitely know how to draw and label a chloroplast and a mitochondria, explain where the light reaction and Calvin cycle occur and explain where the stages of cellular respiration occur in the mitochondria and also the products of each of these Calvin cycle and the stages of mitochondria. I mean, sorry, the stages of cellular respiration. Okay. In terms of entropy, why can't things be brought back to life? Okay. If you've, if you've noticed on the news lately, they've talked about restoring some of the brain functions of a pig that was dead for several hours. Yeah, um, not really. They just got some circulation back in there, but not really anything meaningful. The reason why, you, once something dies, it's gone. It has to do with the second law of thermodynamics and entropy. Entropy is a measure of disorder, right? So the, the more entropy you have, the more disordered you are. It also comes down to like information. So think about this. If I took your notebook and you have all your writing on it, you store information in the sequence of letters on your book, right? On your notes. If I, if I take it and burn it, I've increased entropy, but I've also permanently lost all of that information. You could gather every bit of energy lost to the environment and the flame. You could gather every piece of soot and and smoke and CO2 and water, but you could never recover that lost information. When it comes to life, information is stored in DNA and in our brains, it's stored as, well, I guess really complicated in how the neurons store it based on the, on the, on the structure of the neurons and all the proteins in it. And at, at, at our level, like so that you can never have a zombie apocalypse, what happens is the minute life stops at, at the molecular level, several things start to happen. First, your brain requires almost 20% of all your energy every day, even when you're daydreaming in class or sleeping. It's still requiring 20% of your energy budget just to store and maintain all those memories. So once, once you cut energy off from your brain, all that energy you use to maintain your, your memories and your personalities and all that information stored in your brain is like rapidly lost. That's why when people have heart attacks, strokes, or drown, and go without oxygen for much more than five or six minutes, brain damage it incurs rather quickly because you're losing that information that makes you who you are rather fast. At the cellular level, death is really a function of loss of membrane potentials. And once cells start losing those membrane potentials, once again, the, the information that's there 
that that cell has to maintain life is a loss. And when you start adding energy back into it, the mechanisms to use that energy to keep all those metabolic processes going to keep the cell alive are, are lost. Just like when a person is dead and you, I mean, if they're, I'm not talking about heart stopping, I'm talking like you're, you're, you've cut oxygen off to the brain, those cells die rapidly. You can bring them back, but only for a few minutes, unless they were really, really cold, because of course cold slows down entropy. But uh, basically, yeah, you, you lose information. That's the big problem. So that means you don't have to ever worry about a true zombie apocalypse because you could never have reanimation. Okay. Could you review which carbon on the pyruvate is being oxidized during pyruvate oxidation? All right, Koi, here you go. That's a good question. And let me. So pyruvate is a molecule we see a lot in biochemistry. This is one of those like really important precursors for a lot of biochemical pathways. And another, another thing that's cool about pyruvate is common in nature. The pyruvate, since it comes from glycolysis, and we're going to split glucose into three, we're going to start off with three carbons, and we're going to have a carboxyl group at the top, a carbonyl group here, and then a methyl group here. Okay. So pyruvate oxidation is also called um, pyruvate decarboxylation as well. So decarboxylation, carboxyl group, D means without. This carbon right here gets removed. So whenever we have pyruvate oxidation, this will be oxidized to CO2. And then we now have the acetyl aldehyde, which is then attached to coenzyme A. So this will be attached to CoA, which will bring it into the Krebs cycle. And it's this carbon with the carboxyl group that uh, gets oxidized to carbon dioxide. Okay. Destiny, explain how inductive resonance, resonance energy transfer works in an antenna complex. You know, the best way to think of this is the wave. If you've ever been to like a really big sports stadium, you know, people do the wave and everybody, as a wave comes, you stand up and you go, yay, and then you sit back down. But the point is, is that the energy comes to you, you stand up in energy, and then you sit right back down without ever changing place. But then your energy is transferred to the person next to you who also stands up and then goes back down. So this is resonance, and it's a perfect example of it. So in an antenna complex, as light comes in to the antenna complex and hits the electrons, well, light's got photons of energy that, you know, and when they hit the electrons, they elevate that electron in energy. But in the antenna complex, that is that um, electron goes up in energy, it then drops back down, and as it drops back down, it transmits that energy to the next electron. So the electrons go up, down, up, down, up, down, until they get to the center of an antenna complex, and that's a reactant center. And that's when all that energy will be concentrated to send an electron way up in energy, and then it will be picked up, of course, by uh, pheophyton and taken to the electron transport chain. But that's basically how inductive resonance works. Okay, Bonnie, why do redox reactions in biology often involve following hydrogen? That's a really good question. A lot of times when we're, when we're doing redox reactions, we're not just removing electrons from organic molecules. We're also stripping them of their hydrogens. So think about glucose, right? C6H12O6. And then the product is carbon dioxide, which has no hydrogen attached to that. So as we're also pulling the electrons off the organic molecule, we're also stripping the hydrogens away from it as well. And ultimately those hydrogens will end up on oxygen and uh, reducing the oxygen to water. Or if you think about photosynthesis, here that carbon is gonna get reduced to uh, from carbon dioxide to an organic molecule we're going to strip hydrogens off of the off of oxygen so we're going to actually oxidize oxygen in the light reaction then we're going to transfer those hydrogens and the electrons to carbon dioxide to form an organic form of carbon which has of course carbon and hydrogen to it so like i said in organic chemistry you know because we're oxidizing organic molecules or we're making organic molecules it often involves a transfer of the protons with the electron as well okay Okay. Oh. 
Okay, Bonnie, why is energy released when an element is reduced? That's a good question. And it goes back to chemical energy and how we store energy and the bonds of molecules. So if I have a, a, a simple organic molecule, let's just take methane, okay? Basically, this is a covalent bond, and that covalent bond is a nonpolar covalent bond, meaning these electrons are shared equally between the carbon and the hydrogen. Now, that's important because think electrons, energy, like electricity. The amount of potential energy the electron has in a chemical bond is a function of its proximity to the nucleus of the element and the electrode negativity of the element. In a nonpolar covalent bond here, these two elements have very similar electronegativities. Not the same, but very similar. What that means is the electrons here are basically as far from the nucleus as possible. So these electrons have as much potential energy as they can have. But when I react this with water, I mean, sorry, with oxygen, what's going to happen is I'm going to get carbon dioxide plus some water, I haven't balanced this equation, sorry guys, but I'll, I'll do that next time. But here it is. Now I've got carbon dioxide. So now all of a sudden these electrons that were once shared equally that had you know, as much potential energy as they could, these are now, the carbon has been oxidized, but the oxygens have been reduced because oxygen of course is sharing the electrons equally here, but here they're, they're, they're moving closer to the oxygen. Because the electrons move closer to the oxygen, because oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, it's got eight protons versus six protons, those electrons have lost energy, right? Well, because they lose energy, second law, and I'm sorry, first law of thermodynamics says, hey, we can't create or destroy energy. We have to keep it equal. As these electrons move closer to the oxygen, the electrons lose energy, and to, and to satisfy the first law of thermodynamics, they emit photons of light. So when you see a flame, you're seeing the formation of carbon dioxide and water as the electrons uh, move closer to the oxygen. They're being uh, reduced, or the oxygen is being reduced, and it's giving off energy as a result of that. Okay. What would a proton channel put in the inner membrane of the mitochondria due to ATP? Well, you know, think about this, right? So this is what happens to hibernating mammals and babies. It's called brown fat, and that proton or that protein channel is actually a channel protein called thermogenin. So let's draw mitochondria, something if you want to do well on your next test, you'll know how to draw. You got the outer membrane and the inner membrane here. This, of course, is the intermembrane space, and this is, of course, the matrix of the mitochondria. Okay, so we've got the electron transport chain going along here. It's pumping all these protons into the intermembrane space, creating a proton gradient, which then through my ATP synthase, they flow through it in a process called chemiosmosis and make lots of ATP. But if I bypass ATP synthase, let's say I just jam a proton channel in here, well, they can bypass ATP synthase and go down this uh, protein channel. It's actually called thermogenin. And what happens is you don't make any ATP, but you still generate heat. So hibernating animals, you know, they, they need to keep somebody heat up. They don't want to go completely frozen, but they also aren't moving around. So they don't have the ATP requirements that you and I have as, you know, in a mammal that's active, maintaining, you know, 98 degrees Fahrenheit. So by bypassing the ATP synthase, you still generate heat, but you don't generate the same amount of ATP. You're, you're, you're bypassing that. You're skipping out on that. So that's what would happen. You would generate heat, but less ATP. Okay. What is the purpose of, a, of kinase and cofactors? Well, a kinase is any enzyme that basically adds a phosphate group to something. And, and, and if you ever take biochemistry, uh, you'll learn that kinases are really important for um, adding on phosphate groups to things. So sodium potassium pump, you know, to change the shape of the pump, you have a kinase that adds it on. If you're talking about cell signaling, you have kinases that basically 
will stick a phosphate group onto your onto your second messengers and activate them. So that's important. Cofactors are things like coenzyme A. What they do is they help facilitate chemical reactions. Okay, Ruby, how do scientists deactivate CRISPR-Cas9? You know, that's a good question. Uh, I don't really know the answer to how they would deactivate the CRISPR-Cas9. Um, my guess is, is this is, you know, a very precise set of molecular scissors that will go find a specific sequence of DNA and cut that specific sequence. So to deactivate that, I imagine there's probably some type of RNA or a protein that you would add to it that would bind to that molecule and inactivate it. Uh, like I said, that's um, something I don't really study a whole lot of, but that's a fantastic question. You, you kind of stumped me on that one. Okay. Can you go over competitive inhibition and allosteric regulation? Okay. Good question. Let's, let's go back to drawing an enzyme. Remember, protein enzymes facilitate chemical reactions. They speed them up. So let's say I've got an enzyme, and I've got a little site down here. And let's say this is my active site. This is where the substrate will bind to this active site, OK? This here, this is my allosteric site. So here's how this works. If you have competitive inhibition in a protein, what happens is, is some molecule uh, will bind to the active site here. So if this is my substrate. If I have competitive inhibition, some molecule will bind to the active site and prevent my substrate from being able to bind to that. That would be competitive inhibition. And a lot of times in competitive inhibition, it could be the product of a metabolic pathway that can bind there. But in addition to binding to the active site, it can also bind to this allosteric site here. Draw my little pizza coming in. Once again, if you have allosteric inhibition or allosteric activation, some molecule will bind to this site and change the shape of the active site. So if you're, if you're allosterically activating this, you'll change the active site so that the substrate can bind to it. If you're inhibiting it, this will bind to it and change the active site so your substrate can't bind to it. So these are how competitive inhibition and allosteric inhibition or allosteric um, work, okay? And like I said, a lot of times these molecules, these regulatory molecules are the products of the reaction. So for instance, in glycolysis, basically at the allosteric site is literally ATP and it stops step three, which of glycolysis, which is basically a, a, a 1,6-phosphofructokinase, which is an enzyme that phosphorylates 6-phosphofructose. Um, uh, and if you have a lot of ATP, it'll actually bind to this um, phosphofructokinase and change the shape of it and slow down the rate of glycolysis by preventing it from doing substrate-level phosphorylation. Okay. Let's see. What is the connection of cofactor? What is the connection of cofactor inside of an enzyme to abiogenesis? Yeah, so what's interesting is that you know, you've got coenzymes, you've got enzymes, you've got cofactors. And a lot of these cofactors are they're, they're metals, you know, they're like magnesium or iron or some metal or some metal ion that uh, is really good at facilitating chemical reactions. So basically, what happens is uh, a lot of our proteins are built around some type of metal ion uh, or metal or ion that can facilitate some type of chemical reaction. And abiogenesis, A means without, bio means life, genesis means startup. So abiogenesis is the origins of life from non-living components. And in abiogenesis, uh, we think they got started in alkaline vents and they got lined up with these metal ions like nickel and magnesium and iron and these would facilitate chemical reactions by basically taking hydrogen gas and adding it to carbon dioxide and forming things like well, methane or 
acetaldehyde or even pyruvic acid or pyruvate. And so that's why we think they're important to that. And even today, like I said, a lot of our enzymes are built around these metal ions. I think of hemoglobin is built around iron or um, chlorophyll is actually built around magnesium. Okay. Which causes of climate change would you say are the biggest contributors? Okay. Uh, currently, right now, the burning of fossil fuels. That is the biggest contributor to climate change. There are other things like deforestation is a big one. And also uh, you know, somebody brought this up and it's really sad, but um, eating a lot of beef also is a big contributor to climate change as well. But right now the, the biggest one is burning of fossil fuels, both coal and oil. Why won't, okay, Grace, why won't UV and infrared light work for the light reactions? That's a really good question. And the reason why is ultraviolet has got a lot of energy and it can actually damage uh, proteins. I mean, it's got enough energy to go in there and like oxidize or break down proteins and, and cause damage. So plants actually depend on bracing themselves from it. And the, the other end is infrared. Infrared uh, doesn't have enough energy to work. So the, the, light, the, the light waves are too long. It doesn't have a, quite the reaction that it needs. So when you have the light reaction, what you have to do is you have to elevate, I'll show you, um, electrons to a specific energy state. Now, this isn't a quantum mechanics class, but basically electrons exist in a ground state in these specific energy states. It's either here, here, or here. You can't exist in between, right? Oh, sorry. So it's got a ground state, a second energy state, or a different or a higher energy state. And basically, you know, ultraviolet would be, it would put it way up here, but it would also start to damage the cell. Uh, infrared would only kick up an electron maybe this high, which would not put it in this discrete energy state. So there's just not enough energy. And the same reason with green light. The reason why green light doesn't work is because green light would kick up an electron to around this place. And electrons can't exist in between energy states. They can only be in either the ground one, two, or even a higher one. So... If you kicked it up to here, it just falls right back down to ground again. So green light doesn't work. Infrared doesn't have enough energy. And ultraviolet, uh, the, there's not good pigments for absorbing ultraviolet light except to, like, prevent damage. Good question. Okay. What type of organism is the first to evolve photosynthesis? Is it cyanobacteria? You are absolutely right. Cyanobacteria was the first organism to evolve, uh, especially oxygen and photosynthesis. And of course, cyanobacteria are prokaryotes. And that just goes back to say, you know, prokaryotes, you know, don't call them primitive, right? They, I mean, they have a 20 minute to 30 minute life cycle and they evolve quite rapidly. And they were the first to evolve things like oxygenic photosynthesis and almost every other metabolic pathway on the planet. Okay. Emily Smith, what would happen if you block the flow of electrons to oxygen in the electron transport chain? Okay, that's a good question. And in fact, understanding that question understands how something like cyanide kills people, or if you're a fish biologist, how you can use rotenone to uh, clear out a stream of invasive fish. So I'm gonna draw the inner membrane of my mitochondria, and let's draw the electron transport chain, complex one, two, three, and four. Okay, so here's what happens. I mean, basically, we're going to oxidize NADH to NAD+, and of course, complex two is just going to oxidize FADH2 to FAD, and now we have these high-energy electrons, right? And what these high-energy electrons are going to do is active transport. We're going to pump protons into the intermembrane space and create an electrochemical gradient. And of course, we use this electrochemical gradient to make ATP through uh, chemiosmosis. Now, oxygen is our final electron acceptor. And it takes the electrons off of complex four, picks up some of the protons coming through here, and it makes water, right? Now, the reason why chemiosmosis and aerobic respiration work so well is because Oxygen is the second most electronegative element in the universe, 
it allows those electrons to fall way down in energy. So at each step, the electrons are becoming more and more and more oxidized, which means they've, they have less and less and less energy. So you need a very strong oxidizer to pull them up here. So as they go down this electron transport chain, they go down in energy, they're pumping protons into the intermembrane space. If I blocked the flow of electrons, what would happen is that this whole system would become reduced. There would be no flow of electrons. It would just become reduced. These pumps would shut down. Eventually, the protons would come through here and reach equilibrium. You would lose your electrochemical gradient and ATP production would stop. So the immediate cause of blocking the flow of electrons is the whole complex becomes reduced. Your proton pumps stop pumping protons. You lose your electrochemical gradient, it collapses, and uh, you no longer produce any ATP. And that's what cyanide does. Cyanide and the uh, and, and rotenone both block the flow of electrons on the electron transport chain. And uh, surprisingly, that membrane collapse or that loss of electrochemical potential on that inner membrane causes the mitochondria to like send out a death signal to the rest of the cell. So the entire cell could actually die pretty quickly from that. Okay, good question. Okay, hold on. I gotta find them here. Man, I moved it and went all the way down. What type of, okay, we got that one. Why must, why oxygen must be removed when brewing beer and wine? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, because when you beer, when you're brewing beer and wine, uh, you have to have an oxygenic uh, thing. Because if you remember, uh, beer and wine are using yeast that go through what is called ethanol fermentation. That's why when you brew beer, it's got bubbles, right? And in wine, you actually allow those bubbles to escape. If not, you've got sparkling wine, right? And the reason why is if you let oxygen into uh, the yeast, what will happen is they will complete cellular respiration. I mean, these things are eukaryotic cells, right? So they'll just break down all the sugars, carbon dioxide and water, and uh, you'll have a bit of ethanol, but you won't have anything sweet. You won't have any sugars left because they'll just continually break it down. And well, you won't even have any alcohol. Sorry, you won't, you won't have any fermentation. So yeah, if you, if you allow oxygen to your beer, it just will break everything down and you'll be left with nothing. So what happens is when you deprive them of oxygen, they go into ethanol fermentation and uh, eventually, you know, around, depending on the yeast you're using, anywhere between 6 and 12%, maybe even as high as 15%, they, uh, they'll kill themselves by drowning in their own ways, which would be ethanol. Okay. Can you go over endosymbiosis related to mitochondria? Well, first of all, you know, eukaryotic cells evolve through a process called endosymbiosis, which means inside living. Basically, two prokaryotes merged. Now, we're a little fuzzy on the details, but we think it was basically uh, one aerobically respiring bacteria bored into an archaean, maybe a methanogen or methanotroph. I can't remember which one right off the bat. But basically, that aerobically respiring bacteria that bored its way into an archaean eventually evolved into being a mitochondria, and the whole cell started living together right? They get a symbiotic relationship. And that led to the origins of eukaryotic cells as the cell grew larger and more complex, because as the cell got larger and larger and larger and larger, you could just get more and more and more mitochondria built in there, making ATP for them. Okay, destiny. Explain what happens to the pH in the inner membrane space of the mitochondria during cellular respiration. Oh, well, that's pretty straightforward here. So if I'm pumping protons into the inner membrane space, well, pH is a is populate or potential of hydrogen ions, so or hydronium. So as you pump protons into the inner membrane space, you keep increasing the concentration of hydronium ions or hydrogen ions. Oh, it looks like I lost focus there. And um, the pH it it it, uh, it gets lower and becomes much more acidic. Okay, Maxwell, from your review. What would happen to ATP production if you place a proton channel in the inner membrane of the mitochondria? Isn't there already a proton channel? Sure. So ATP synthase is a uh, proton channel, facilitates the diffusion of the protons down there, um, 
uh, concentration gradient, but, a, but a ATP synthase harnesses that proton motor force to make ATP. However, if you placed a channel like a, a molecule called thermogenin, which we already talked about, is what mammals do in brown fat, it bypasses ATP synthase, so you, you, uh, you produce heat, but you don't produce the ATP. Megan, can you explain the difference between a C3 and a C4 pathway? Okay, that's a good question. There's a lot to this. I want to cover it briefly here, but basically the original photosynthetic pathway was a C3 pathway and uh, it evolved. I mean, it was the first one to evolve and this enzyme called herbisco, ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase evolved in a, in a low oxygen environment. So what happens is um, Rubisco also has an affinity for oxygen. It'll fix oxygen as well. That over here a little bit. Okay. So in a C3 pathway, what you have is this enzyme Rubisco. It adds CO2 to RUBP, ribulose bisphosphate. And if you remember ribulose, you know the difference. Uh, it's a ribose. It's a five-carbon sugar, but it's a it's an isomer of um. Of, of ribose. Ribulose is the ketone, and of course, ribose is the, the aldose. But anyway, we Rubisco takes CO2 and sticks it onto this five carbon molecule, ribulose bisphosphate, and immediately splits into three um, carbon compounds, into two, three carbon compounds. Okay. So they're going to have three carbons here. That's why it's called a C3 pathway because your initial carbon fixation is done by Rubisco adding to REBP and forming a three carbon compound. Okay, uh, and the, the issue is that, like I said, Rubisco being a really old, old, old enzyme, been around for probably three and a half billion years, has an affinity for oxygen. So, and when plants get drought stressed, you know, they have to close the stomata to prevent water loss. Well, when you close the inside of the cell off from the atmosphere, what happens is, uh, you, you conserve water, but as photosynthesis continues on, you draw down CO2 levels and you build up oxygen levels, and Rubisco begins to fix oxygen to REBP instead, and you, you start uh, oxidizing the carbons you tried to fix. So what we have next is um, another enzyme called PEP carboxylase. Carboxylase, and what PEP carboxylase does, phosphoenyl pyruvate. This is a three-carbon compound here, and what it's going to do is take CO2 and add it. Add PEP carboxylase. PEP carboxylase is going to add it to this actually phosphoenyl pyruvate. So add this CO2 for it to it. It's going to form a four-carbon compound called um, well oxalacetate, and then it's going to go on to form malate, and then malate. Um, would then be shuttled into the, the bundle sheet cell. So let me show you something different here. So in the C4 pathway, PEP carboxylase has no affinity for, uh, for oxygen, but it does have an affinity for CO2 at a much lower level. So it adds CO2 to a three-carbon compound, phosphoenyl pyruvate, and forms a four-carbon compound, which eventually is, becomes malate. Now, here's a difference, is if I've got a cross-section of my leaf, and I've got a vascular bundle here. Now, don't worry about understanding the vascular bundle. You'll get to that in 304. But surrounding this vascular bundle here is a series of cells called the bundle sheath cells. And then outside of these bundle sheath cells here would be the mesophyll cells. And PEP carboxylase is going to be in these mesophyll cells. So in C4 pathway, the initial carbon fixation takes place in the mesophyll cells, okay, through PEP carboxylase. And it forms a four-carbon compound. Oxalacetate is the first one, and then it forms, and then oxalacetates convert to malate. And it's transferred, it's carried into the bundle sheath cells, and then malate releases a carbon dioxide in here. 
So what the C4 pathway is doing is, is building up CO2 in these bundle sheath cells here. And then we have the regular Calvin cycle in the bundle sheath cells. And the Calvin cycle, of course, will use um, Rubisco to fix this CO2 here into organic compounds. So what's going on is that in a C4 pathway, the initial carbon fixation and the carbon fixation of the Calvin cycle, where you actually make your carbohydrate, is separated in space. Initial carbon fixation is in the mesophyll cells uh, by PEP carboxylase, and then it concentrates it into the bundle sheath cells, where uh, Rubisco will fix the carbon dioxide into a carbohydrate by the Calvin cycle. Now, the reason why C4 pathways uh, don't take over the world is because when malate releases the CO2, it has to remake, it forms um, pyruvate, and that pyruvate needs to be phosphorylated to form PEP and also, I believe, reduced even. So this extra step to recharge phosphorylopyruvate requires extra energy. So the C4 pathway, the, the trade-off is, yeah, you can live in a drier environment, but that pathway costs you more energy than a C3 pathway. Okay. So keep in mind initial carbon fixation versus uh, um, where it's actually fixed in the in the Calvin cycle, two different places in the in the um, C4 plants. Okay. Why oxidative phosphorylation is more efficient at making ATP than substrate level phosphorylation? Okay. So it's always about my Mountain Dew. Like here's my can of empty diet Pepsi. Yeah, diet Pepsi. I drink way too much of this stuff. But let's say that you go up to a soda machine and this diet Pepsi costs you 75 cents, okay? If you put in 74 cents, you don't get a diet Pepsi. Let's say you're really thirsty and you put in a $5 bill. Well, you get your diet Pepsi, but then the, the machine keeps your, you know, four set, 425. Okay, substrate level phosphorylation is really similar. To make ATP cost 7.3 kilocalories of a mole of energy, just like this costs 75 cents in money. In substrate level phosphorylation, you've got to couple that reaction with an endergonic reaction. So you want your endergonic reaction to be as close to 7.3 kilocalories a mole without going under. Anything more and it's lost, anything less and you don't get any, any ATP. So substrate level phosphorylation is not the most efficient way of generating ATP. And in fact, in cellular respiration, we only get like four ATPs from that. Oxidative phosphorylation is, imagine I have a piggy bank and every time I have a reaction that releases energy, I can take some of that energy and store it in my piggy bank. I can store the change. And every time I get exactly 75 cents, I go buy a, a Diet Pepsi, okay? And uh, oxidative phosphorylation, I'm storing energy as an electrochemical gradient. Every time I get approximately 7.3 kilocalories a mole, I can make a molecule of ATP. So you're able to store all those bits and pieces of energy in electrochemical gradient rather than having to directly couple that with a, um, an exergonic reaction. Okay. Explain the difference between cyclic and non-cyclic electron flow is how it affects the Calvin cycle. Okay. So we're talking about the light reaction. We're talking about cyclic and non-cyclic electron flow. So I'm going to try not to be uh, too confusing here, but let's say I've got a thylakoid membrane. Okay. And on that, I've got photosystem two, and then I've got some cytochrome complex. I'm just going to call it CC. And then I've got photosystem one. And this would, of course, be the thylakoid membrane. This out here would be the stroma where the Calvin cycle is going to take place. Okay. So in photosystem one, we're going to split, we're going to, we're going to split water and we're going to create, of course, some oxygen. And it's going to, it's going to take the electrons off of here. The energy and sunlight is going to split. I mean, we're going to use it to split this water. Oxidizing oxygen is pretty crazy. And we're going to elevate these electrons and energy. And then, of course, we've got these other molecules, phaophyton and, and PQ, which will then take the electrons to the cytochrome complex. And this is going to go through this cytochrome complex, 
and it's an electron transport chain which will pump the protons in here like this and then these electrons will be shuttled over here by pc the plastocyanin they'll be elevated once again in energy when they get elevated in energy ferrodoxin will then take them over here to nadp reductase this is a molecular complex they will then take nadp plus and reduce that to nadph and these electrons will then go into the Calvin cycle. All right. This is an example of linear electron flow because the electrons are going to flow from the uh, water. We're going we're to get the electrons from water. We're going to elevate them. We're going to run them through the electron transport chain, re-elevate them, stick them to NADPH. And then NADPH will then uh, be used to reduce carbon dioxide in the Calvin cycle. So it's, a, it's linear. It's from the water to your carbohydrate through this process. Now, cyclic electron flow is, you know what? Sometimes Calvin cycle needs a little bit more ATP than you get from the electrons that come out of this water that we can get from you know, a couple of electrons here. So in cyclic electron flow, what's going to happen instead of ferrodoxin taking the electrons to the NADP reductase, the electrons will then shuttle it back to the cytochrome complex. It will be run through the AT, I mean, sorry, the electrons will then run through the electron transport chain again, pumping more protons into here to generate more ATP. Okay, so as they're going through cyclic electron flow, they're not necessarily going to be quickly available to the Calvin cycle, but we do produce more ATP from these electrons. This also required for the Calvin cycle. Okay. Where is the proton buildup which allows for ATP synthesis synthase to run? Well, proton buildup, if you're talking about oxidative phosphorylations on the inner membrane of the mitochondria, and uh, if it's in um, photosynthesis, it's on the inside of the thylakoid or the thylakoid space. Okay, compare and contrast aerobic with anaerobic respiration. Oh, man. Okay. So whenever you hear the word aerobic, what that means is with oxygen. So typically when we often talk about cellular respiration, we, we usually just automatically mean using oxygen as, a, as aerobic respiration. But the, but the reality is anaerobic respiration is you're still using an electron transport chain to create an uh, electrochemical gradient for your chemical osmosis. You're just using a different electron acceptor than oxygen. So that would be anaerobic respiration. Now, we, we start talking about anaerobic processes to make ATP, and of course that would be glycolysis, but that not, that's just a, a substrate-level phosphorylation. Now, when it comes to exercises, running is aerobic. Anything you're doing that you can sustain for a few minutes or more if you're in shape is, is aerobic. And then anaerobic is things that uh, you basically, you're, you're creating a load on your muscles that's faster than what they can supply ATP through aerobic respiration. So anaerobic is things like sprinting and weightlifting. Okay. I'm going to explain why a C4 plant uses rubisco and what cells would you expect to find rubisco? Well, first of all, rubisco is used for the Calvin cycle. So the reason why is because uh, C4 plants also do um, the Calvin cycle. So you need the Calvin cycle, you need rubisco to fix carbon dioxide to ribulose bisphosphate. So even though uh, a C4 plant has two carbon fixations, the, the initial carbon fixations in the uh, mesophyll cells with PEP carboxylase, and then your, your primary, or your, sorry, your other carbon fixation where you actually enter the Calvin cycle occurs in the bundle sheath cells. So that's where you'd find rubisco in a C4 plant. Emily, what would happen to ATP production if you placed a proton? I've answered that twice already. Uh, go look up thermogenin. That's what I can say. It's uh, look up brown fat in mammals because I, I've, I've answered that question twice tonight. Okay, Isaiah, how is a cofactor different from a coenzyme and how do cofactors link to the origins of life? So a coenzyme is basically like in a coenzyme A. It's an organic molecule that helps facilitate a chemical reaction. In this case, coenzyme A brings acetaldehyde to, um, or a acetyl group to the Krebs cycle, but it's also used for other processes as well. A cofactor are maybe metal, metal ions that are in part of an enzyme 
or help facilitate chemical reactions. And I've already talked about how they're important for the origins of life. Maxwell, could you go over how PS2 and PS1 work together? He has a good question. So basically, I think I got it right here. In, in, in the light reaction, we start with photosystem two. And the reason why it's called photosystem two is because, well, photosystem one was discovered first. This one was discovered second. And basically, the way they work together is photosystem two is used to rip these electrons off of water. We're, we're oxidizing oxygen, right? And that requires a bit of energy and some special enzymes to do so. But because uh, the electrons coming off of water are so low in energy, what photosystem two does is energize these electrons to a much higher energy level. And by energizing them to a higher energy level, they can be used to power an electron transport chain to create our electrochemical gradient. So we can transform the kinetic energy in sunlight to an electrochemical gradient so we can make ATP through uh, chemiosmosis. Then once they go through the electron transport chain, just like in oxidative phosphorylation, their energy has been used, they're spent. So they're not really of any use to be put into a, um, an organic molecule. So photosystem one will re-energize those electrons to a much higher energy level. And then, of course, they'll be carried by ferrodoxin to NAB, NADP reductase, where they will be uh, forming NADPH to be used for the Calvin cycle. Bonnie, if you are to look for a sign of life on another planet, what would you look for? Is it oxygen or carbon dioxide plus methane? Uh, I wouldn't really worry so much about carbon dioxide, although that would be a good sign. Methane, you know, they found methane on Mars. Uh, I'm still holding out. They'll find life on Mars, but it's probably a dead planet, unfortunately. Got a good Enceladus or Europa, but I'd look for oxygen. Uh, oxygen is really reactive and... Uh, Basically, the only reason why the Earth has so much oxygen is in, in our atmosphere is because of photosynthesis. It's a biotic process putting it in there. There are abiotic reasons that would create or processes that would create a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere, but those are probably rare. And if you found a rocky planet in the Goldilocks zone with an oxygen-rich atmosphere, I would say that's a smoking gun for photosynthesis. And if you've got a high oxygen atmosphere, it's highly likely that you could have complex life at that point. If you don't have an oxygen-rich atmosphere, you can write out complex life. Okay, Jen, if someone were to offer you pizza for dinner, would you be disappointed that it's not Indian food? <laughs> I guess my, yep, I love pizza, as everybody well knows, and I also love Indian food, but I would love some pizza. Yeah, pizza's like the perfect food. It's got like everything on it. With rising CO2 levels in the atmosphere, how would this affect C4 and C3 plants? Ju, that is a fantastic question. And it's one that a lot of scientists are actually starting to study right now. And it's, it's a very nuanced reaction too, right? So the issue is with rising CO2 levels, you could imagine that C3 plants uh, not having that extra energy step would outcompete C4 plants. And uh, that's true, all things being equal, if they get more water. So you could see where C3 plants could really, if you've got enough water and nutrients, you'll outcompete a C4 plant. However, uh, with warming atmosphere, that increases evapotranspiration. That increases drought. So you could have, like, let's say Albuquerque. We could get the same amount of rain as we always get. But if we warm up just two degrees, we're in a drought because the rate of evaporation is so much higher. So same amount of rain, drought. And in that case, the C4 plants would outcompete the C3 plants because they're better off uh, with they're better at water efficiency. Maxwell, did I come up with an extra credit question? Ah, I've only gotten one vague email about a good extra credit question. I'm still looking. I, I I'm, I've almost written the test, so it's got to come in soon. Email it to me. Uh, pop culture reference galore. It's got to be something fun that somewhat relates to uh, what we've talked about in class. Bonnie, how would cyclic electron flow affect the Calvin cycle? Uh, a couple of different ways. If you don't have electrons for the electron for the Calvin cycle, it could potentially slow it down, but it would also produce more ATP that could keep it going. So it's a nuanced reaction. I probably won't have uh, how it'll affect the Calvin cycle other than reducing the amount of electrons flowing to it and the amount of ATP. So Ruby, thank you for doing the review. Hey, uh, 
no worries. I'm, I'm glad I could help out. You know, this is easier than me showing up to class. Okay, Jack, can you explain the evidence for the hypothesis that predicts that alcohol fermentation may have led to the agricultural revolution? Yeah. Uh, you, the, the idea is like, why did humans give up a nomadic lifestyle after 190,000 years? Why did they settle down and start planting crops? And uh, so we look back at our archaeological record, you know, what evidence do we have that they were growing stuff? What were they using to grow? And the earliest archaeological artifacts we find from that very beginning of the agricultural revolution are like plastic you could use to ferment stuff. So we think that basically um, producing alcohol uh, created a, a drink that was well, people like alcohol. It uh, had nutrients to it. It was safer to drink than a lot of water because uh, water is, well, diarrhea is like the one, the number one killer of people in the world. So you'd have less chance of getting sick from it. And alcohol also um, helps break down social norms, uh, helps people meet and interact and become more social. I mean, how many of us have met a, a new best friend over a couple of drinks? And we think that alcohol actually helped break down some of the social barriers that prevented people from uh, getting together in large groups. And then, of course, once you started planting crops for alcohol, they had the bright idea like, wait, we could now save our crops for food for later. So there's a good New York Times article on that. So if you and if you Google it, there's some there's some fun stuff out there. They, I believe the, uh, the documentary on YouTube or Netflix is pretty cheesy, but I don't know if I agree with everything on it, but some of it's pretty good. Okay, Jack again. Can you explain why the addition of phosphate groups and other molecules in exergonic reaction? Well, actually, it depends. It's usually an endergonic reaction because whenever you phosphorylate another molecule, you typically add potential energy to that molecule, making an endergonic reaction. Okay. How energy coupling works to drive endergonic reactions. I've, I've covered that several times earlier. So come in that some of the first questions people were asking. Ju, can I do one more live tomorrow? Yeah, um, I think so. I'll give out an email reminder at seven uh, before 7.30 tomorrow to see if I can do that. Uh, I think it would be easy to do that. And then Aja, why organic molecules such as carbohydrates stable at room temperature? I discussed that first thing in the in the in this review, but basically uh, the answer is that it requires energy to break a covalent bond. So if you don't have the activation energy required to break a bond, that molecule is going to be relatively stable. Okay, I'll say 40. Uh, I think um, I have some pizza waiting on me, so I will see you guys later. I think tomorrow we'll work again and uh, study hard and. Bring your questions tomorrow and we'll we'll go over them and good luck on the test on the final on Thursday. All right, bye.